Starship 15 takes to the sky and survives. We'll talk about what's next. We've got a very special Starlink mission coming our way. Crew One gets some shoot action bra during their return from the ISS. And we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. SpaceX was targeting Tuesday this week to launch their fifth fully stacked Mars rocket prototype, Starship Serial Number 15, but was scrubbed due to poor weather conditions. However, despite a low layer of cloud coverage the following day, the industry-leading rocket manufacturer pressed the ignition button and the vehicle lifted off on its journey to bluer skies. At an apogee of about 10 kilometers, 15 went horizontal and begun its short belly flop back to the surface. And just as it was coming through the clouds, it lit up two of its three Raptor engines to return vertical and made the fleet's first ever nominal landing. Starship heading back to the lander zone. And despite cooking their Raptors to a well done temperature, the rocket was successfully secured shortly after. The following day, Highway 4 was opened up down there in Starbase, Texas, and locals got a glimpse at the lone surviving Starship. And only one heat shield tile was missing, so it looks like SpaceX is making excellent progress on mechanically attaching those to the hull as well. The explosions they encountered previous to this moment were a necessity for success and will most likely occur again in the future. But that's okay. It's the only way to create rapid and fully reusable orbital rockets, the fundamental technology revolution needed to make life multiplanetary. So what comes next now? Elon tweeted the day after the launch that they might try to refly 15 soon. So if that ends up being the case, they'll most likely repeat what they just accomplished, a flight to 10 clicks and back. And that wouldn't be unusual. The company flew Starship to 150 meters twice with SN5 and 6. But you never know, maybe they'll go a little higher. And thanks to SpaceX's lack of fear of blowing things up, Starship SN16 is already on deck, stacked in the high bay and receiving its finishing touches like aft fins. Soon enough, she'll be rolled down to the launch pad to take the next big step toward Mars. And while things tend to change pretty rapidly down in Starbase, and nothing is confirmed at this time, we know Elon at one point said they would eventually take Starship to a higher altitude and test the heat shields. So personally, my guess is they may go a little higher for 16's flight, but perhaps not past the Kármán line and into space, at least not yet. A couple weeks back, the Federal Aviation Administration did grant SpaceX permission to go ahead and launch Starships 15 through 17. But the question remains at what altitude was the permission granted to? 10 clicks? And if so, now that 15 was successful, will SpaceX request an addendum to fly higher? Only time will tell, and by time I mean Elon, or one of his employees. Word has gotten out that SpaceX is targeting about two weeks for SN16's launch, which is pretty aspirational and not confirmed, and might not be the case now that Elon has said they may try to refly 15. But with that being said, SpaceX did fly SN11 less than a month after SN10 exploded. So I'd say launching 16 by the end of this month is very realistic. Regardless of what happens next, an important thing to remember is that public support for putting life on Mars is critical to making it happen and Elon believes 2024 is not out of the question for an uncrewed flight to the Red Planet. Now on to Starlink. The next SpaceX rocket launch for sure looks like it's going to be Starlink 27. Scheduled to place 60 more Constellation satellites into orbit this weekend on Sunday at 2.42 a.m. Eastern. On May the 4th, SpaceX launched their 26th flock of Starlink sats to orbit on a record-tying booster that lifted off from the Cape for a ninth time. That booster survived to fly another day, making a perfect bullseye landing on the drone ship, of course I still love you, on the Atlantic. There is currently more than 1,400 Starlink satellites in orbit at this time, and already more than half a million people have opted in for the service. But Starlink 27 will be one for the books. Since Falcon 9's development, the company's goal was to get to the point where they could refly their boosters 10 times. Some even say that's the number required to break even as far as manufacturing costs are concerned. Well, this mission could be the first time they meet that objective. Booster 1051 has flown nine missions prior and has been charged with leading the fleet to number 10. I've spoken to SpaceX engineers in the past and they told me that these milestone missions always get their adrenaline pumping. But you and I know they got this. Elon has said in the recent past that there is nothing stopping them from launching a single booster 100 times. It just takes more refurbishment and part replacement the more they launch. Transitioning now to Dragon News, Crew One's Dragon capsule, Resilience, departed the International Space Station on Saturday morning after the longest mission for an American crewed capsule at 168 days. 
Several hours later, the astronauts re-entered the atmosphere, popped their drogue chutes to slow down and stabilize Dragon, which in turn pulled the mains out so we could all bear witness to that sweet shoot action bra. Splashing down in the gulf in the dark, where they were fished out of the water by the Go Navigator recovery vessel. And for reasons I can't quite wrap my head around, all four astronauts were happy to be back down here on Earth, where gravity is the ultimate buzzkill. Pulling up! He's pulling up! He's coming down! Five days later, Resilience was spotted by Greg Scott, finally arriving back at port. Soon, it will undergo refurbishment of its own and receive a new cupola bubble in place of its docking adapter. Because for its next mission, it won't be going to the ISS. Instead, it will take the first 100% private passenger crew, known as Inspiration4, on an orbital joyride around Earth for three days this fall. That crew is currently training for their space vacation. They just returned from Mount Rainier. Okay, as you know, I don't do promotions that often, but Mother's Day is this weekend, so if you need a good gift idea, here's one. Nomad is a California-based tech accessory manufacturer that prioritizes design and quality over all else. They feature products like wireless chargers, USB-C lightning cables with Kevlar, cases for iPhone and leather EDC gear like passport wallets, and normal wallets, which utilize leather from Horween Tannery in Chicago, same tannery that makes leather for the NFL and NBA. And they come with this awesome tile tracking feature. Never again will your lawyer wife contemplate her marriage to you as you cry yourself to sleep after losing your wallet on a business trip to Kentucky. Click their link in the description below and use the promo code SXC for 20% off through the month of May. Oh, and did I mention they too like rockets? But now it's time for today's honorable mentions. Former Senator Bill Nelson was sworn in as NASA's newest administrator this week. Jim Bridenstine was there in virtual form to show his support so I'm making him the honorable mention. And on Wednesday, the same, <laughs> the same day SN15 launched and Alan Shepard became the first American in space 60 years prior, Blue Origin announced their plans to launch their first astronauts to space on their new Shepard rocket on July 20th, the same day Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon 52 years earlier. The company made the decision after successfully launching the rocket 15 times, and the capsule was capable of carrying up to six people on a suborbital joyride past the Kármán line and back. And one seat is up for auction, so if you got the cash to bid, go for it. The winning bid will be donated to Blues Foundation, Club for the Future. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for checking in. And shout out to all my generous supporters on Patreon and the YouTube membership program. You too can support the show by joining up using the links in the description below. Have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed. So tomorrow night, Elon's hosting SNL, a show that I haven't found funny in several decades, but I will be watching tomorrow night. And let me explain why. So as soon as the announcement was made that Elon was gonna host, he and the show were both immediately attacked by the far left. And even some of the show's own cast members went after the decision. Now that, with that being said, some cast members have shown their support and even went to dinner with Elon to get to know him better. And, uh, my hat's off to the show itself for not backing down to the woke mob on Twitter. Now, the reason the far left isn't particularly fond of Elon is because he's been pro-freedom and anti-lockdown, has called out the hypocrisies of socialists in the past, he knows pronouns are derp, knows woke Twitter is just a bunch of posers, and that unions are worthless thieves that steal from the working class and give to the Democratic Party. Now, in full disclosure, some of those words are mine, but you get the gist. But if you ask me, I think the real reason, the main reason why the far left doesn't like Elon is because he's successful. He's a billionaire. And far left socialists tend to be sore losers. Now, I'm not saying they're losers because losing is not a bad thing. Failing is never a bad thing as long as you learn from that failure. But the reason why I call these people sore losers is because they have failed one way or another. Maybe they think they're not successful enough, but instead of learning from that failure, they blame other people, namely the rich. And when you do that, you're not gonna learn anything. You're not gonna better yourself in any way. You're just gonna bring other people down. And that's exactly what socialism does. Capitalism got us to the moon. We beat the USSR, which was communism. And make no mistake, socialism is just a route to communism. And Marxism is the way you get there. The American way is what brought Elon from South Africa to Canada and eventually to the United States. He came when he was a college student 
had nothing, slept in the basement on couches of his friend's house while he was trying to earn his degree, ended up doing startup companies, sold them for more profit to make other bigger companies and more successful companies like SpaceX. And really, that's a story every American should celebrate. But it seems to me that since his commute, especially since his commute from lockdown California to free Texas, his worldview has kind of changed. It seems to me he's becoming more, dare I say, conservative or at least individualistic. And maybe he's always been that way, but it's, it, perhaps he's also surrounded himself now that he's in Texas with more right-minded individuals who are very familiar with what it means to be an American. So Elon, if you happen to be watching this, just know the American people and the entire world really who isn't woke has your six, bro.